Good, mor good morning, St. Barnabas. Praise the Lord. He is risen. Um, it's been um, a year in Mark's Gospel, and um, as Semi said, um, today is the final reading, and it's my privilege to read from chapter 15, verse 40, 16, verse 8. So won't you turn with me in your Bibles? Please to chapter Mark, chapter 15, verse, beginning at verse 42. It was preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance to the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid, just so far. Good, well, thank you, Gillian. Good morning, everybody. It's lovely, lovely to see you. This is the fifth of our uh, services in Holy Week, and I just want to start by thanking everybody for uh, working so hard to keep the show on the road during the week. One of the disadvantages, I suppose, of being a small church is that everybody's got to do something, and, um, and you all have, and I'm very grateful indeed to you. Although I have to say, with the students this morning, I was listening to, we were listening together to a talk on George Whitfield, um, and we heard the astonishing statistic that he used to preach for up to 60 hours a week. Preaching, that's not preparation preaching for 60 hours a week, so perhaps we're not even trying, and uh, we need to work a bit harder. Please have your Bible open at the passage that uh, Gillian read for us, and I'm going to begin by asking for the Lord's help. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for bringing us together this morning. 
Thank you for giving to us the scriptures. We thank you that the scriptures are God-breathed and able to make us wise for salvation. And we do pray that you would speak words to us this morning that are timely and needful and helpful and wonderful. And we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what will these verses in Mark's Gospel do for you this morning? Uh, One of the things they might do is to remind you that your feelings are not the most important thing. Uh, Where the Gospel is concerned, it's facts and not feelings that matter. And I say that because the tension between facts and feelings is very apparent, isn't it, in our passage. So at the end of chapter 15, we we see a man traveling to the cross. Uh, He's planning to collect the body of Jesus and bury it. He's feeling pretty courageous. I think that's clear from the text. But he has relatively few facts to go on. And then in chapter 16, we see a few women traveling to the tomb, and uh, they're planning to anoint the dead body of Jesus. And they're feeling nervous, uh, nervous about pretty much everything. But eventually, the facts will break in on them and change them permanently. Now, I wonder if you agree with me, but as far as I can see, most people today put very little thought into how to arrive safely in the next world. How often do you meet people who are thinking and planning and trying to work out how to arrive safely in the life of the world to come? I think you'll agree it's pretty rare. And yet we know plenty of people, don't we, who are planning and exercising buckets of energy on how to stay safe in this world. Now, uh, that was brought out uh, a couple of years ago in a new play that was staged on the London London stage. It's got a rather strange title. Uh, It's called The Phlebotomist. That begins with a PH if you want to look it up later. The Phlebotomist. And in case you don't know, a phlebotomist is somebody who opens up veins. It's rather topical at the moment, isn't it? They open up veins either in order to drain them or in order to inject them. And this play is really about genetics. And it raises some fascinating questions. For example, what if a blood test could tell us exactly how long we would live and exactly how we would die? First question. Second question. If those blood tests were made compulsory, what difference would it make? The play says that bad test results, meaning results showing those people who are not going to live for very long, would mean that probably you wouldn't give certain jobs to those people and you might not want to marry them. On the other hand, good results would mean that you gave those people the best jobs and you'd be delighted to marry them. Third question, what if the scientists were bribed to falsify the results? And if healthy people were caught and killed for their DNA? Well, it's an unsettling but rather ingenious idea for a play. And I think it reminds us that the subject of life and death is never very far from our minds. And if we're wise, we're going to want to face those facts about life and death very carefully. So I want us to think about these verses this morning under two headings. Number one, a brave trip to the cross. A brave trip to the cross. And then secondly a nervous trip to the tomb. So firstly then, a brave trip to the cross. Chapter 15, verses 42 to 47. 
In verse 42, we're told that it's the evening of Good Friday. Jesus is dead on the cross. And there's a man called Joseph who wants to bury him. Now, normally, a criminal on the cross would be thrown into a common grave unless their family stepped in and did something for them. Now, we can't be sure why Jesus' family haven't shown up at this point, but this man, Joseph, he takes the initiative. Notice in verse 43, we're told that he was a prominent member of the Jewish council. Now, that's fascinating because the Jewish council have just voted to kill Jesus. So it's pretty obvious that Joseph was not in agreement with that decision because we're told in verse 43 that he was a secret believer who'd been waiting for the kingdom of God. Now, that doesn't, by the way, mean that he was like so many Jewish men of his day who was waiting for the Messiah who hadn't yet come. No, it means that he believed Jesus had brought the kingdom and would soon bring it to fulfillment. He was convinced. So Joseph goes to Pilate and asks if he can have the corpse. Now, why is that an interesting moment, uh, Joseph going to Pilate? Well, imagine for a moment that we could ring Mark on a spiritual cell phone and ask him why he's giving us these particular details. Uh, Mark, tell us please, why of all the many things you could tell us about the death and resurrection, why this? Because we're, we're busy people. Uh, we've got relatively short concentration spans. We want to know the things that are really, really important. In one of the other gospels, we're told there's an earthquake. In another one, we're told that the risen Jesus met two disciples on the road to Emmaus, and he spoke with them. And in another gospel, we're told that the risen Jesus had a meal of fish with his disciples on the beach. Why are you telling us this? And I think that Mark would say that it's because Joseph made a decision. He made a decision. He didn't actually know everything. But he did know enough to make a stand for Christ. And even though at this particular moment, Jesus is between death and resurrection at the end of chapter 15, Joseph is firmly persuaded that Christ can be trusted. Now, Pilate, you remember, would not make a decision. He held off from doing anything until his hand was forced by the crowd. And so Pilate is, I guess, like so many people today who claim to be agnostic, they tell us they just don't know. But as I'm sure some of you know, that's usually a smokescreen. And the truth is that their pride or cowardice stands between them and an honest, careful decision. And because Pilate was stubbornly uncommitted, he remained opposed to Christ. But Joseph was different. As I say, he, he didn't know everything. The one thing he did know for sure was that Jesus had died. He hadn't fainted. And Mark also wants us to know that Jesus really had died because he tells us in verse 44. Please look at it. It says, Pilate wanted to make sure, so he summoned the centurion and asked him if Jesus had already died. Verse 45. The centurion says Jesus was dead, and Pilate gave the dead body of Jesus to Joseph. Verse 46, Joseph wraps the body, the dead body of Jesus, in linen. And in verse 47, the two women saw where the dead body of Jesus was buried. And I think, you see, this is what makes Joseph's decision so very special. Because you see, the council had voted against Jesus. And now Joseph turns his back on the council and turns his face towards Christ. Now think about it. I imagine there were a lot of people on that council 
uh, who turned their back on Jesus, who thought they'd made the right decision. But 2,000 years later, where are they? By contrast, Joseph turns his back on the council and puts his trust in Jesus, and 2,000 years later, where is Joseph? I've no doubt that it was the end of any kind of polite welcome for Joseph into council meetings. I mean, you can, you can imagine, can't you, the kind of gossip that was going on amongst the council members. Uh, did you hear about Joseph? He betrayed us. He's thrown in his lot with that dead Nazarene. What a waste! What a tragedy. What a tragedy for his family. I mean, he's got to be mad because he thinks that this dead man holds the keys to the future. Bonkers. But you see, I suspect that Joseph had been listening to Jesus very carefully. I suspect he'd heard about the miracles, the healing of the sick and the, the raising of the dead. Had he heard the promises of Jesus? I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Had he heard... Jesus' prediction that he would die and then rise. I mean, after all, Jesus said it at least three times. It seems, doesn't it, as if the truth had penetrated his mind and transformed him. And he was persuaded that Jesus had died for him and that Jesus holds the keys to the future. And he was willing to bet everything on Christ. Now surely, verse 43, have a look at the word, that's why he went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. And won't you please remember that Joseph did this before the resurrection. So Joseph had less information than you and I have this morning, but it was enough for him. And therefore I consider Joseph to be one of the great unsung heroes of the New Testament because he was a man who was prepared to go against the crowd and pin his hopes very wisely on Jesus. I think it's a great thing that uh, in our increasingly secular pagan culture that this weekend has still been preserved as special. Uh, of course it's a lovely opportunity to spend time with friends and, and family and enjoy a break from our normal routine. But if you've been with us through this past week, I'm sure you know there's far more to this weekend than time off work. I understand that uh, the Powerball is a hugely popular lottery uh, here in South Africa. I've never done it myself, I know nothing about it. But apparently people who haven't got enough money to eat properly believe that spending a few rand on the Powerball is worth it for the tiniest chance of making their dreams come true. Now, what could possibly be sadder than having the winning ticket or the winning number in your pocket and doing absolutely nothing about it? And here we are with the spiritual equivalent of a lottery-winning weekend. And yet people are totally unwilling, aren't they, by and large, to get on their knees and ask Jesus for forgiveness and for mercy and the new life that he came to bring. In 2007, the four most famous atheists in the world had a, a one-off uh, discussion online concerning the tension between faith and reason. Uh, their discussion was actually published in a book, you can get it on Kindle, called The Four Horsemen. Now these are, without question, highly intelligent men. And you would think, wouldn't you, that these highly intelligent men would have solid arguments to back up their position. But the extraordinary thing is that they don't. For example, concerning the resurrection, Christopher Hitchens, who died a couple of years ago, said, I'm glad it's not true because it would be horrible. Now that's his argument. 
I mean, where's the weight in that? And therefore, I think we've got to ask ourselves, why is there such disinterest in Jesus Christ, the best man who ever lived? Why is there such hostility towards him? This person who's, who's come into the world and taken away the danger of all our sin and who's opened a way out of the grave for anybody who wants to take it. But people say, no thanks. I think if Mark was standing in this pulpit this morning, he would say, well, the reason is that more people are like Pilate than like Joseph. In other words, we, we lack the courage as a culture to go with the facts. But Joseph was different. He made a brave trip to the cross. Secondly, in our passage, we see a nervous trip to the tomb, chapter 16, verses 1 to 8. And we come to these women. Now, they witnessed the burial of Jesus. We saw that, didn't we, in the last verse of chapter 15. And now they're making a trip to the tomb in order to anoint the body of Jesus. Now, in order to understand what's going on here and why this is recorded for us, we need to just put aside the political correctness of our culture. And we need to remind ourselves that in the first century, women were disqualified as witnesses. Not as far as God was concerned, not as far as Jesus is concerned, but they were disqualified by Rome and they were disqualified by the religious establishment. And that's why you see these verses describing the women witnessing the burial, uh, the women witnessing the empty tomb, and the women testifying to the resurrection are so powerful. Because you see, if Mark was writing a work of fiction, if he was making this up, he would have included some seriously impressive witnesses, wouldn't he? But Mark isn't writing fiction. He sticks with the truth. And the truth is that God chose women to be there for the burial and for the resurrection. And of course, we know that there were women at the cross as well. And against the culture of the day, God decided that these women were the perfect witnesses for the greatest miracle in history. And yet, having said that, they are nervous. Now, of course, we know, don't we, that Jesus had said he would be alive by Sunday, but they obviously don't believe that. They're nervous because they think Jesus is dead, and the reason they're going to the tomb is to anoint his body. They're probably also nervous because they know there's going to be a large stone across the entrance, and they don't know that they're going to be strong enough to move it, verse 3. But when they arrive, they discover the stone's already been removed. Mark doesn't even pause to explain how that happened. He just says it's been rolled away, the tomb is open. And when the women walk in and see a young man sitting there, they're nervous, they're alarmed. So can you see that their feelings at this point are all over the place, rather like the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. Their feelings also at that point, they were all over the place. The young man in the tomb is an angel. We know that from the Gospel of Matthew. But when the women see the stone has been moved and the tomb is empty, and they see the young man, they're still no clearer, they're still unsure, they need somebody to explain things, because seeing is not always believing. And therefore, in verses 6 and 7, this young man begins to explain what's happened, because we need a clear explanation. You see, we can look at the cross on Good Friday and say, oh no, this is a terrible tragedy. But it's not a tragedy. Or we might say, well, you know, there's Jesus on the cross. He's just setting us an example. No, he's not setting us an example. 
God gives the explanation, he died in your place. And in the same way, we might stand in our minds at the empty tomb and say, well, someone stole the body. But no one did steal the body. Or we might say, we're at the wrong tomb. But we're not at the wrong tomb. And God says, through his messenger, look at the text, he has risen. And then this angel says ten things to the women. Number one, don't be frightened. Number two, you're looking for Jesus. Number three, he was crucified. Number four, he has risen. Number five, he's not here. Number six, go and tell the disciples. Number seven, he's going ahead of you. Number eight, he's in Galilee. Number nine, you will see him when you get to Galilee. Number ten, by the way, Jesus already told you these things. Ten things. Great summary, isn't it? And of course, Jesus had said to them, I'll see you in Galilee. Where did he say that? Chapter 14, verse 28. So it is vital, isn't it, if we're going to understand the facts that God gives an explanation for these historical events. But now that he has explained things... We want the women in the very last verse of Mark's gospel to say, great, we've got it. Hallelujah. It makes sense. We're full of joy and courage and confidence. We're going to run off and tell everybody. That's what we want them to say. But they don't. Verse 8. Trembling and bewildered, The women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. End gospel. (laughs) And uh, at that point, you and I think, what an absolutely terrible way to finish the gospel. Because it's such an anticlimax. And uh, over the years, the church has been rather embarrassed about it, and the church has said, well, we can't just leave it like that. Uh, We'd better add a couple of extra paragraphs and finish on on a much more upbeat note. And that's why in our Bibles, we've got those other verses that were tacked on about 100 years later. But Mark didn't write them. So once again, what we've got to do is take out our spiritual cell phone and call Mark in heaven and say, what on earth were you doing? Why did you finish your beautiful gospel with verse 8? It is so depressing. I think Mark would say something like this. You've forgotten that I began my book by telling you that the gospel was predicted by God in the Old Testament. And specifically, in the first few verses... I drew your attention to Isaiah chapter 40. Please go and read Isaiah chapter 40 again, and if you're still confused, call me back. So friends, as our series comes to a close, why don't we do that? Please keep a finger in Mark, turn back to Isaiah chapter 40. We're going to look at just two verses. While you're turning there, let me remind you that Isaiah's book divides in two parts. Chapters 1 to 39 tell us that God's people are under his judgment because of their persistent rebellion and disobedience. Then chapters 40 to 66 are all about God's plan to rescue and restore them. So in Isaiah 40... God is introducing his rescue plan, and a number of experts believe, with good reason, that Mark had Isaiah 40 in his mind when he wrote his gospel. (coughs) Please look with me at verse 3. A voice of one calling, in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. 
Now, I'm sure you'll remember that is precisely how Mark begins his book. Uh, He quotes that verse, and he says that John the Baptist is the voice in the desert, getting everybody ready, because God is coming. Now look ahead with me, please, to verse 9 of Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40, verse 9, God is speaking, and he says, You who bring good tidings to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Don't be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. Now, friends, the good tidings, that phrase that appears twice in that verse, that's another phrase for the gospel. Good tidings, good news, gospel. Now, here's the point. Verse 9 is the only place in the whole of Scripture where a command not to be afraid is combined with a command to preach the gospel, to show people the way to God. And verse 9, please notice this, says that we're not to do that quietly or secretly. We are to lift up our voices with a shout. But in Mark's gospel, who's going to do it? The tomb is empty. The angel has confirmed that Jesus has risen. The Son of God who died on the cross is alive, just as he promised. But who's going to spread the good news? Are the religious people going to do it? Well, of course they're not. They're the ones who wanted him dead. What about the disciples? Are the disciples going to do it? Well, the last time we saw them in Mark's book, they ran away terrified, didn't they? Now, of course, they haven't met the risen Christ yet. And when they do, they're going to be completely and wonderfully transformed. They'll receive the Holy Spirit. They'll take the gospel all the way around the Mediterranean world. But at this point, that's still in the future. And what about the women who saw Jesus die, who saw where he was buried, who heard the good news about the resurrection directly from the angel. Are they going to do it? Well, not according to verse 8. But obviously silence wasn't the last word, was it? Because by the time Mark wrote his book, (laughs) lots of small churches had already been planted throughout the Roman Empire. And today, there are more than, I think, two billion people on planet Earth following the Lord Jesus and worshipping him in churches this morning. So the silence of the followers of Jesus in Mark's gospel wasn't the last word. But consider this. Mark was writing to the church in Rome. And that church was under pressure. Christians were being persecuted. Uh, They had been saying... Jesus is Lord, and the Romans were saying, no, he isn't. Caesar is Lord. And under growing pressure, of course, the temptation to stop spreading the good news is very real, isn't it? Is that not our situation as well? We know that today you can't go around saying Jesus is Lord in the public square without there being consequences. Some consequences are more serious than others, and in some countries, they're fatal. But even in South Africa today, you can't, in most schools, most universities, most major institutions, you can't say Jesus is Lord full stop. If you do, you won't make many friends, you might well make a lot of enemies. Can I suggest that the reason Mark ends his book like this is because he's asking all his readers then and this morning to consider what our response will be. Are we going to be like the women in verse 8, knowing the truth and yet saying nothing because we're afraid? 
Many people will do that. Or will we share the good news of our living Lord? Because, friends, the tomb is empty. Amen? Amen. Jesus is risen. He is on the throne of heaven this morning. And he's holding out the offer of a fresh start with God for everyone who hands over their sin and their life to him. So how can we share this great good news this week? Here are three ideas for you to take away and pray about. First, we can give you two short but highly effective introductions to the Christian message. Very simply put, one is called, What Does God Want From Me Most? Trust me, most Christians don't know the answer to that question. And the other is called, What Are Christians Saved For? What Are We Saved For? They're short, simple studies. Any Christian with no training can share them with a friend. Very, very easy. If you want copies of that, come and ask me afterwards. Second, you can invite your friends to come and do Christianity Explored. Uh, It's a short, video-based, but very powerful course introducing people to Jesus, actually through the Gospel of Mark. And if you'd like to do that course, either for yourself or with a friend, again, Come and ask me afterwards. We'll sort it out. But the third thing you can do is next Sunday morning, we're starting a new series on the life of David called Looking for a Leader. Our brother White is actually going to be giving the first sermon. And it is always best to bring someone to the first talk in a new series so they get in right at the ground floor. So why not invite somebody to come along next Sunday morning so they can begin to discover the treasures in God's word for themselves. Won't you do that? Won't you pray about that on this Resurrection Sunday? Let's bow heads. Let's pray together. Our gracious God, we do thank you for the wonderful good news of the empty tomb and for the witnesses who were there. Please give us courage to spread the good news of our risen Lord Jesus with all those you put in front of us this week. And we pray that as we do so that you would take your glory in our lives and in our church family. And these things we ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Thank you, Pastor, for uh, this beautiful word. And I think all of us here are challenged with the truth that our Lord Jesus is risen. And we as Christians, we still have the task to tell to others who did not believe. Because the world is not yet rich with the gospel. And this is something that as Christians, we should be ready to share this truth of the gospel. Hallelujah. So can we all stand so that we can sing together?
we bear. no any other name that can save us, only the name of our Lord Jesus. And the mission is for us to go out and share. May we take our seats. And the music will continue as we give our opportunity. <laughs> 